Hello everyone and welcome to today's Mondac webinar in association with CF Maritime Legal and renowned experts to delve into the main features and advantages of the Madeira International Shipping Register. My name is Charlie Greenhead and I'm joined by a brilliant panel to take us through today's discussion. Katia Fernandez is the founder of CF Maritime Legal Services. With two decades of background in maritime law and ship finance, she has vast experience in providing services to international companies. Katia acts as legal advisor in relevant cross-border transactions on behalf of international ship owners, banks and leasing entities, with particular emphasis on credit facilities secured by mortgages registered in Madeira. She also assists clients in other shipping related matters, including regulatory, crewing, labor, and tax. Katia is an arbitrator in maritime disputes and is an expert consultant at the MIO. Katia also teaches postgraduate studies in maritime law at Portuguese universities. Marina Pimenta has 15 years of background in domestic and international tax and maritime law with a vast experience in matters related to the MIBC. Marina has been directly involved in relevant legislative projects in the maritime sector in Portugal and has experienced in the promotion of the MIBC and the MIR in several European countries. Marina provides legal assistance in matters related to the tonnage tax, the incorporation and management of companies within the MIBC, ship, reg ship registration, regulatory matters and labor disputes. Albrecht Gunderman, lawyer by education, has been in the maritime industry in various capacities for 25 years. Today, Albrecht acts as managing partner of Euromar, the exclusive agency to promote and operate MAR, the International Portuguese Ship Registry. Albrecht is also co-founder of OceanScore, the platform to make emissions transparent. Before his career in shipping, he worked in German politics and in the Israeli judiciary. Now, before I hand over to the panel, a quick housekeeping item. You can submit questions to the panel by typing them into the questions pane of the toolbar on the right-hand side of the page. The panel endeavor to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session, but please do reach out to them after the webinar for additional information. It's now my pleasure to hand you over to Katia, Marina, and Albrecht to begin. Thank you. Uh, uh, hello, good afternoon to, to all. Thank you first for all your interest and for joining this webinar. It's a pleasure for us having uh, you uh, with us without losing more, much more time because I'm pretty sure your question is why MAR and why the International Shipping Register is the best or one of the best shipping registers in the world for you to choose and to work with, I will give you an uh, overall overview of the International Shipping Registry of Madeira, of MAR, and then my colleagues will address other uh, relevant subjects too. Can we get on to the next slide? <laughs> So I will start with the background and the goals of MAR. Why was it created? I will then address the main characteristics of MAR, its main advantages, and then I will uh, shortly address some of the advantages for shipping companies uh, registered within the Madeira International Business Center. We can go ahead. <laughs> So why was MAR created? So it's a long time uh, that MAR was created. It was created back in 1989 in Portugal. And the goal was to uh, put an end to the process of um, flagging out of Portuguese vessels. The goal was to have more Portuguese flagged vessels to enhance the maritime uh, industry in Portugal and to have more ship owners and more vessels, vessels operating and registered within the Portuguese uh, flag. Attracting more vessels would necessarily develop uh, also other shipping activities and increase the know-how in the shipping industry and the shipping sector in, in, in Portugal. So these are the goals uh, within why MAR was uh, created. It was created as a second registry, uh, not as the first one, because we have a conventional registry, but I will explain it further on. But um, these were the goals. Uh, put an end to the flagging out and attract shipping activities and more uh, vessels to, port to the Portuguese flag. Next slide, please. 
so MAR, it's important to stress that MAR is part of the International Business Center of Madeira. It is, uh, uh, the vessels registered with MAR have the Portuguese flag on it, but they are registered within Madeira. It's a Portuguese registered, but the name in the vessels will be Madeira. And in place since 1989, and Albert will uh, gladly explain how the fleet has been uh, evolving these last uh, few uh, years. Next slide, please. The main characteristics. So MAR uh, is a special register, an insular and outermost region. What do I mean by, by this? It's special because, as I told you before, we have the conventional register, and then we have the special register, which has special rules, um, more um, flexible and attractive than the general system in place um, that Cassia will uh, explain mostly in the mortgage regime, which is uh, very relevant and different from the general regime. It's an insular and outermost register because it was put in place in Madeira, which is an outermost region of the European uh, Union. It's an open register because uh, you can uh, register a vessel with MAR without having a Portuguese company. So any entity uh, can register a, a, register a vessel with MAR without incorporating a company in Portugal, although a local form of representation will be required. And Albers company, the company that Albers represents, will be very happy to help you providing that uh, representation services and helping with the pre-registration and the registration procedure too. It's a selective register, and why? Because you cannot, we cannot allow for the registration of fishing vessels and war vessels. Any other type of vessels are allowed under the, the MAR uh, flag. It's also a double register, and why is that? Because we have a, a technical register where, where, where the technical experts of the vessels will be registered, and then we have a legal uh, register where uh, any uh, legal aspects of the vessels are registered within the commercial registry office, which are mortgages, liens, and uh, other legal aspects of, uh, uh, of vessels. Next slide, please. As to the main advantages, advantages of MAR, I will uh, address three advantages. General advantages, the crew, the, the advantages for the crew members and also operational advantages. As to the general advantages, uh, as Portugal is part of the EU, MAR uh, is an EU flag which grants a full access to international and also to EU cabotage. MAR is white listed at Paris MU and Tokyo MU, which is quite relevant in terms of port state control and also in terms of international recognition of the flag and is also part of the US Ship 21 program since this year, starting this year, which is quite relevant for vessels registered with MAR operating under the jurisdiction of the, U the US Coast Guard. MAR offers a competitive pricing, uh, enabling uh, ship owners and operators to have a reduction, a reduction on the fees applicable uh, when registering more, more vessels. It uh, provides and allows for its certificates. Uh, it's important to mention that the ownership certificate can be issued through an e-certificate. Also, the crew endorsements can are also e-certificates, which is um, quite remarkable because we are one of the first flags introducing e-certificates in this matters. Also, MAR provides for the exemption from notarial and registration fees. So if you are to register a mortgage or a lien over a vessel registered in, in MAR, uh, that registration will be um, excluded from notarial and registration fees. MAR also allows for vessels to be registered on the basis of a bare boat charter registration in and out. So uh, it's, uh, it offers us these general advantages, um, uh, which are quite relevant when you're thinking on a flag to, uh, or, or to register the vessel you operate. Next slide, please. As to the crew, 
crew is a very very relevant aspect on the maritime of, of the maritime of, operation and the mar regime has also considered this relevant aspect and it has introduced very flexible crew nationality requirements so the law states that at least 30 percent of the crew must be european uh, members uh, nonetheless you can apply for exemptions on this requirement if you can if you cannot meet um this percentage of uh, crew this is this in practice has been working perfectly and um it's a very flexible uh, requirement mar has also introduced a very competitive social security regime whereby crew members uh, do not need to be mandatorily uh, enrolled within the portuguese social security system but they can if they are willing um so it's not mandatory they need to have a social security regime in place either private uh, or statal which can be from their country of origin or it can also be the portuguese general regime or it can be a pni through a pni club so as long as they can prove that they have a social security regime it's not mandatory to be enrolled within the portuguese social security system Group members are also exempt from personal income tax in Portugal for any income that they perceive uh, from working on Portuguese flag vessels. Portugal is also a ratifying member of all the international conventions which are relevant in terms of crew members' labor relationships, namely the Maritime Labor Convention and other ILU. So for this reason, MAR follows the international rules on crew members and crew members relations labor relationships reason why it has never been classified as a flag of convenience by uh, ETF next slide please as for the operational advantages you have registration services available 24 7 which is quite relevant when you have the vessel which is being deleted in another country and then needs to be uh, re registered within the Portuguese flag and sometimes the time frames are not the same and you need to request the commercial registry office to be open outside the normal operating hours and uh, if required this service is in place and available you have registration services available 24 7. you also mar also provides you with a technical commission available 24 7 if you have a problem with a vessel you, if you need uh, a renewal of, of a certificate so whatever happens with the life of the vessel which depends which depends on the intervention of the flag you have this technical commission available 24 7. mar has also introduced uh, armed guards legislation uh, following emu uh, regulations on this matter which is quite relevant when you have vessels operating in areas which require this legislation to be in place uh, mar also offers a very competitive mortgage regime which katia will address so i will not extend on this subject because katia will better explain and is more experienced to do to talk about this uh, regime uh, and as in terms of operational advantages, MAR is also compliant with um, the international email uh, convention. So all relevant international conventions have been ratified by Portugal and are also applicable to MAR flagged vessels. And MAR vessels registered with MAR are also eligible to benefit from the, ton the Portuguese tonnage tax regime, if so willing. So they can combine. Uh, some of the advantages of MAR and with the tonnage tax regime. Next slide, please. What about shipping companies? I have started by saying that you do not need to incorporate a company in Portugal to benefit from the, the advantages of MAR and to register a vessel of MAR. But if you do want to do so, because if you want to have a shipping company in Portugal, either to own the vessel, to operate the vessel, or to have charter activities, or even other activities as crew management activities, or uh, technical uh, management of vessels, you can incorporate those companies within the Madeira IBC regime. Madeira IBC regime is a regime which is in place, uh, uh, approved by the European Commission, um, 
and which grants companies incorporated within Madara IBC the possibility to benefit from a reduced corporate tax rate of 5% in all income uh, received from the operation of that company, as long as it um, arises from activities held outside the Portuguese uh, territory. Uh, aside from this reduced corporate tax rate, shareholders can also have benefits by incorporating a company within Madeira IBC because if the company generates dividends, which we expect it does, uh, there will be a full exemption on withholding taxes on the payments of div dividends to shareholders. This regime also uh, enables companies registered to benefit from other tax advantages like uh, reduction, on stamp duty or in property tax if the companies are to buy property in Madeira to develop their activities. But I can expand on the, the advantages for these companies if, they, if uh, anyone is willing to have more information on, on, on this. I would just like you to know that aside from the advantages of the MAR flag, you can also have advantages for companies engaged in shipping activities if you decide to incorporate them in um, Madeira. Uh, I will now hand over to my colleague Katia, uh, which will expand on the, um, the mortgage regime. And thank you all. And uh, I hope you have uh, a lot of interest in mine and a lot of questions so we can convince you to, to, to change your vessels all to Madeira. Thank you all. Oh, I believe you're on mute at the moment, Katia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Um, and actually, I would like to start by thanking Mondak for having challenged us uh, to be here today and for having the opportunity to speak about the Madeira Ship uh, Registry. And also a special thank to Alprish, Dr. Alprish Sunderman, that has accepted our invitation to join us, to join CF, Maritime Legal Services. I am pretty sure that he will give valuable insights about the Madeira Ship Registry today and in the future. Um, so I will focus my presentation on the ship mortgage regime. Um, probably, can you please move to the next slide? So just I can explain a little bit how I have my presentation. So I have divided my presentation basically in four different topics. So first of all, I will address the legal framework applicable to MAR, to, um, MAR uh, mortgages. So the cheap regime applicable to MAR registered. Uh, so indeed, we do have applicable to mortgages that apply to the conventional uh, uh, ship registry. So in this presentation, of course, I will only focus on the regime applicable to uh, mortgages registered on MAR vessels, that I will call MAR mortgages. Um, then I will focus on, on the, the relevant changes that have been implemented in 2020. So the regime has undergone uh, all changes, but I will focus my presentation uh, on this change that has been implemented in 2020, because this one was in fact the one that has uh, the huge impact in terms of, of, of the, the, the increase of, of the fleet um, and also has touched based on the, on the ship mortgage regime. Um, then I will uh, touch base on the main features of the mortgage regime. So I will not, of course, expand on all the characteristics, but I will try to focus on the most relevant ones. And then I will try to explain why MAR uh, is indeed a, a good option or uh, in the context of a, sh a ship mortgage uh, regime and in the context of uh, ship finance transactions in general. So moving into the next slide, please. Well, uh, so I will focus on the main legal regime and I am saying main legal regime because in fact, the regime applicable to mortgages in Portugal results from the combination of... Uh, so when we speak about uh, the regime for ship mortgages, we are talking about, of course, the main decree law, which is the decree law um, 9689. Uh, but we need to also to consider relevant laws that are spread in the civil Portuguese code, in the commercial in the commercial code and the uh, registration uh, land registry 
which is applicable also to ships. So there is a lot of, I would say, legislation that we need to consider when we are talking about uh, the regime applicable to ship mortgages. So uh, this regime was, as Medina said, created in the late uh, 80s. It has already undergone 10 amendments, all with the aim at streamlining and uh, consolidating the regimes, so making the regime stronger and more competitive. I will focus on the ninth amendment that was introduced by Law uh, 56 2020 of August 27, because indeed this one was, in my view, the most structural and the most complex um, amendment implemented so far. So moving into the next slide, please. So the law introduced uh, changes at three different levels that I have uh, uh, divided into bank-oriented changes, commercial registry changes, and operational changes. So banking-oriented changes were, were, in my view, the most relevant one, and I will try to explain why. Uh, commercial registry changes in terms of the process, how the process of, of registration runs, which indeed, um, Significant changes have been implemented vis-à-vis -vis the general regime for, for registration in Portugal. And finally, some relevant operational changes that are related with the functioning or with the increase of uh, responsiveness of, of, of the ship registry. So moving into the next slide, and we'll talk about specifically the banking-oriented changes. So we have implemented changes on the ship mortgage regime on the bare boat charter regime, both with the aim at strength the position of financing banks. And moving into the next slide, um, I have basically tried to answer why. Why did MAR feel the need of uh, including and implementing these changes? I would say that the primary reason for implementing and establishing a, this regime was basically to meet um, the high uh, standards of international bankings that uh, in order by giving them further conditions and further features um, that our Mars main competitors I would say also present. So generally speaking Mars main competitors let's say for instance Malta they are low jurisdictions forming part of what we call the common law system, which generally provides for more flexible and advantages, uh, uh, advantages regime for mortgages when we compare to the civil law system, such as that of Portugal. So in the end, what we have tried to do here in Portugal was to implement a set of features that are typical for common law uh, systems. And I am talking about establishing more powers and more privileges to mortgages. We have managed, for instance, to, um, to establish the concept of the mortgagee in possession, so the power of the mortgagee to um, take possession, real or constructive possession of the vessel when and the mortgage is, is, is in default, for instance. The power also of the mortgagee to prevent uh, the mortgaged uh, vessel to be sold without his prior uh, written consent, and also the power of preventing the creation of a junior mortgagee without his. So this is something that we have uh, uh, managed to achieve. Uh, finally, um, again, the aim and the goal for it was to um, allow the sustainable growth of Mar fleet. So basically, in the end, what I believe the Portuguese government has reached the conclusion that if it really wants to increase the number of Portuguese flagged vessels and place Portugal as one of the leading flags uh, within Europe and in the world, it would really need to create critical changes to the ship mortgage regime, which we have finally managed to do in 2020. And probably our post will be um, able to prove that this amendment has been in fact uh, relevant in terms of the, of the growth of our fleet. Um, also in the context, moving to the next slide, please. And also in the context of granting banks with further privileges, um, an important uh, uh, amendment has been implemented also at the level of the bare boat charter in registration. So we have established the requirement of having the express written consent of the mortgagee in order to allow 
higher boat uh, registration. And in the same way, uh, the possibility of the mortgagee to cancel the bare boat uh, registration in Portugal when the mortgage or defaults its obligations that are secured by the mortgage that is registered in the underlying or primary. In the end, as I was saying, um, uh, changes that has as its main goal to strengthen the position of the international financing banks that are uh, uh, working and uh, financing the fleet uh, registered with MAR. Moving into the next slide, please. Some relevant changes that are also related with the commercial registry, so the process of registration vessels and mortgages that are, in my view, relevant also in the context of so we do have, as Marina says, uh, registration uh, services available 24-7. So it is indeed possible to apply and registration with it, uh, uh, out, uh, outside a normal period of operation of, of the commercial registry, including on Saturdays and uh, holidays. So this measure has proved to be critical for the proper execution of transactions involving different time zones, for instance. So, provided that the parties claim and justify in writing the need of opening the registry office outside the normal period of operation, it is indeed possible today to complete a reflagging procedure and the mortgage, say, overnight. And we have done that already in circumstances where vessels are coming, being delivered from Singapore, for instance, or Hong Kong. So uh, this is indeed uh, um, one of, of, the, of the, 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 the advantages that we can offer and in the context of mortgage registration are really important. Um, this law, this, 20, this law that has been also implemented in 2020, um, has introduced uh, an important role to the Portuguese consulates abroad. So today it's possible to complete uh, permanent registration of vessels and mortgages based on copies of certain documents, provided that original documents are in the possession of Portuguese. Um, so this also has been uh, one of, of, of the milestones that we have achieved. And of course, certain deviations, other deviations uh, when comparing to the general registration regimes, such as, for instance, um, the possibility of resorting to partial translations. Um, we have introduced the, the mechanism of pre-clearance, which is established in the law. So there is this communication with the, with the registrar for pre-clearing documents, which is uh, quite uh, relevant also in my perspective. Um, so basically a set of changes all with the aim at meet the specific needs of the shipping industry. So we are really uh, uh, dealing with the industry and these changes were indeed and are indeed relevant in the context of registering a vessel, in the context of registering a mortgage. Moving to the next slide and quite briefly, please operational changes. Although not directly related with a mortgage, of course, that you can understand that this has an impact also uh, in, the, in the registry uh, and of, of course also the mortgage registration. So what we have managed to do was to increase uh, uh, the qualified human resources. So it has been created a maritime supporting group that is based in Lisbon. So the idea of this is, of course, to increase the capacity or the responsiveness of, of the maritime administration. Um, a digital system allowing for the issuance of e certificates have been created. Marina has already touched the, uh, based on that. So uh, basically a set also of, of changes that uh, had the aim of strengthening the capacity of the maritime because indeed the number of vessels has been increasing and of course it's important to have the capacity also to, 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 to respond to this increase. So moving into the next slide please. So um, yes, again, as I will say, well, I have tried to uh, put together um, some characteristics of, of MAR mortgages. And uh, this, of course, is not an exhaustive list, but I think it can give you a, a good overview. I have divided this in terms of creation, the mortgage, of registration, and several, which are basically other features. So 
creating a mortgage we do not have in portugal and like we do have for instance in other common law jurisdictions a standard form to create a mortgage so we normally have what in some jurisdictions are call, called as deed of covenants and uh, so no standard form in portugal um, in Portugal, we have also the possibility of having a mortgage, which is a typical a bilateral contract, or we can create a mortgage by a simple statement assigned and granted by the mortgagor. So we do have the possibility of resorting to an unilateral mortgage or a bilateral mortgage. Um, notary intervention, and I have uh, introduced this feature because it's important uh, in order to have an enforcement title or in order for the mortgage to become uh, an enforceable title, uh, it is important that the mortgage is signed in front of a Portuguese notary. Um, it is not mandatory, but we highly recommend for the mortgage to be signed in front of the Portuguese notary so that the mortgage can be and become an enforceable title. Of course, that in order to become an enforceable title, the mortgage needs to contain a, a confession of indebtedness. So if you have the confession of indebtedness in your mortgage and the mortgage is signed before a Portuguese notary, then you will have an enforceable title. What does this mean? It means that in case of an enforcement scenario, you don't need to go for a judgment first and first hand, so you can go straight because you do have in hands an enforcement title. Registrations, the relevance of, of registering. Uh, first of all, for you to understand that we do have uh, in, in, in Madeira and for Mar vessels a dedicated uh, commercial registry. Uh, this is a public registry, which means that documents are registered and maintained in a registry which is public. So it, uh, anyone and in any interest party can have access to documents that are registered within the, the commercial registry. As Medina said, no fees whatsoever. So we have the dedicated notary office for Mar vessels, and we have the dedicated registry office for Mar vessels, and none of these are uh, apply any kind of notary or registration fees. Um, the relevance I have introduced effectiveness. This is because under Portuguese law, the registration of the mortgage is a condition for the effectiveness of the mortgage. We do have this rule according to which a mortgage needs to be registered under penalty of having no effect even between the parties. So we really need to register the mortgage. Of course, normally the mortgage, the mortgage is registered immediately after it is executed. So the need of having registration in order to have an effective mortgage. In Portugal, um, the registration determines the priority, of course. So in terms of the date of registration, so this is also relevant. I think that this is like that in the majority of the jurisdictions. So uh, the date of registration is the relevant priority. We have the possibility of uh, registering a mortgage on a provisional basis, which sometimes can be uh, important. This mortgage, this provisional registration is valid for six months. Uh, during this things, six months period, it needs to be converted into definitive, into permanent. The thing about the provisional registration is that the priority that is given is the one for the provisional registration. So after converting the, the provisional into permanent, the priority is determined according to the date of the provisional registration. Um, one more thing for you to know, which I believe it's important, what, uh, what are the public uh, data when you register a mortgage? So when you register a mortgage, your, uh, let's say, certificate of registration showing the mortgage will basically uh, uh, publicity, the, of course, the details of the vessels, the details of the mortgage or the details of the mortgage, the underlying uh, loan agreement, so the reason for the mortgage, the obligations it secure. And then uh, one thing that is also uh, important and in this public is subject to registration is the maximum amount for the mortgage.
So there is, according to Portuguese law, the need of having calculating a maximum mortgage amount. We have full limits on that. Usually or typically, it is the loan principal amount plus a certain uh, uh, percentage of it that is uh, 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 registered as the maximum amount. Very briefly, other characteristics of our mortgages. So secure uh, any kind of obligations, actual, future or contingent obligations, which means that our mortgages can secure complex uh, financing structures, revolving credit facilities and so on. Um, in terms of, of maritime claims, mortgage uh, ranks in third place after court uh, costs and salaries for salvage. Um, and finally, the deletion requirements. So basically, a mortgage cannot be deleted unless uh, there is uh, uh, the authorization, uh, direct authorization, written authorization from the mortgagee. And also, the vessel cannot be deleted while there is a mortgage registered on it. So indeed, we have this safe and reliable uh, system. Moving into the next slide, please. And our final, why MARN? So why choosing MARN in the context of a shared finance transaction? I have basically pointed out three reasons. So I think that indeed, and I think that I have tried to prove we do have a flexible mortgage regime, but still safe, secure and reliable, which is quite important. And we keep track of innovation. So as, as I have explained, the regime uh, is keep to be amended in order to become or to keep uh, uh, as a modern and competitive regime. And uh, last but not the least, uh, we do provide and we do have an engaged ship registry. And I believe that more important, I believe we do have an engaged uh, government keen to maintain uh, the Madeira ship registry as uh, one of, of, of the most competitive in Europe. Um, yes, I think it's all for the moment. Thank you very much. And I will be happy to take any questions after that. I will hand over to Alprecht Stingerman. Thank you very much for handing over. <clears throat> thank you very much for the organizers to organize. And thanks in particular to Katja and Marina for having me in their team today to talk about the Madeira Ship Registry. And also thanks to those who are listening. I have 15 minutes to explain to you <clears throat> why I believe that this is one of the most exciting projects I do see in international shipping. Um, we are in a time where the shipping universe, we believe, is strongly moving from offshore to onshore. And Portugal stands for this change more than most others. You could move to the next slide. Who are we? For whom am I speaking? I'm speaking for a company called Euroma, which is the exclusive agent of the ship registry to promote and operate the same, namely the ship registry. I mean, we have the ship registry where you um, record ownership and encumbrances and you have the flag, which usually consists of various authorities that a ship owner, a ship manager has to deal with almost on a daily basis, that is Portugal. So we're talking about the Portuguese flag, the ship registry of Madeira. Our company went to Portugal almost exactly 10 years ago with the idea that the global change from offshore to onshore does require a service-oriented flag and ship registration solution within the European Union. And gratefully, the Portuguese government, the regional government of Madeira, the national government of Lisbon was very open-minded for that. If we could move on, please. We are now looking into what we have 10 years later. Portuguese flag wasn't really spread very strongly on the oceans of the world, at least not in 2013. If we go back further back in history, of course, that was very different. So it's kind of reconnecting with the history of Portugal, you can say. We look at it today. Today, there's a young fleet of roughly 10 years average. Uh, the flag is um, accepted by all major charters, uh, be it all majors or container liners, white listed on all port state control um, uh, lists, including WISC World Ship 21. And can you, you can review this on the annual statistics of the International Chamber of Shipping. So we move on. I will continue with high speed so I could focus, next slide please, I will focus on particular slides. When a ship owner 
ship manager chooses a flag, obviously um, you should do a due diligence and you should compare the options that you have. You have the general question, you want to have an EU flag, you want to have an offshore flag. And there are so many advantages and disadvantages that you can say it's a very intransparent market and it does require time and discipline and concentration to understand the differences. We believe that today, <coughs> 2023, I apologize, I caught Corona, so I'm sitting here with fever. If it doesn't make sense to you what I'm saying, it's not my fault. Um, so um, if you compare nowadays, 10 years after we joined and came with a lot of ideas that were gratefully mostly accepted by the authorities in Madeira and Lisbon, we believe the Portuguese flag is super competitive and a good choice for every serious and quality-minded ship manager in the world. Um, obviously, the fact that it is a new flag brings a few advantages on the commercial side. It reduces port use in China and in Brazil, for instance. It's a quality flag. You have very competitive pricing and you have a well-working administration. And in between the administration and the ship management, you have Euroma as a service provider. Plus, you have fantastic law firms like CF Legal who support you with all the possibly complex legal matters. So I'd like to move on to the next slide, please. And it, it was bearing fruit. If you look into the fleet growth of the major flags competing globally um, since, let's say, 2018, so we're talking about five years, we, those who are deeply involved in the shipping industry know that Liberia is now the biggest flag and they grew tremendously in the Marshall Islands at big growth. But surprise, surprise, the biggest, fastest growing flag is Portugal. And there are reasons why this is so. 56% since 2018. Could we please move on? <clears throat> why? If I'm if I'm a ship manager and I choose a flag, I have to dive into the matter, how can I operate my vessel competitively? And obviously, the influence of the flag, which determines the jurisdiction on board, has a major impact on the operating expenses of the respective ship. Crewing, social contributions. You will not find a compliant EU social contribution system with more attractive terms than Portugal has. You have the port use that I was referring to already. You have the regular costs of the flag, and I'm not diving too much into details, but you have competitive direct flag fees. You have reasonable costs for crew endorsements, which are supposed to be issued by the flag state. You um, have a, a wise legislation when it comes, just one example, to ISM, meaning no special national requirements, meaning you will not have to undergo a special DOC audit by your RO and so forth. So I'd like to move on, please. And we, you know, we save on our hard drive. And the Portuguese flag, you have very competitive operating expenses. And that goes on. I mentioned it, uh, uh, port use in Brazil. Uh, a container ship calling regularly Brazil with various port calls uh, per annum can easily save something between fifty to $100,000, which makes the direct flag fees that you pay almost ridiculous. Please move on. Um, this is the, the fast part. I will focus a little bit on the two last slides. Same in China, where, in fact, all European flags enjoy the privilege of the strongly reduced port use. If you have a 10,000 TEU container ship, it makes you save $100,000 per year. Offshore flags don't enjoy that, or they enjoy it with an expiry date. Go on, please. I'd like to skip this. Legal and corporate was so beautifully presented by Katya that we move on from this slide and also the next slide. You just have to remember the easiest and leanest and best mortgage you can get is a Portuguese mortgage for both the ship owner because it's simple to handle and it has uh, uh, no notary costs, registry costs, etc. And it's very much accepted by the bank. So what has happened in those 10 years? What you see here is the development of Portuguese flags, the biggest, um, sorry, of European flags. The biggest European flag is Malta, which goes southwards. The same applies to the second biggest, which is Greece. If you look into the various European flags, you see one flag strongly growing, and that's Portugal. And this will continue. Portugal, which 10 years ago had around 100 smaller vessels, um, and is now the fourth biggest, almost third biggest flag in Europe, um, uh, stands at roughly around 800, 820 ships right now, will be at 1,000 by the end of 2024, and we see no end to this growth. So please go on, next slide. So this is now important for you, and, and here I take maybe two minutes, not just half a minute, um, because it illustrates the milestones that were accomplished, and in the next slide I will show you what is ahead of the Portuguese flag. And here we need a lot of concentration. No, 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 you're too fast. 
please go back. Yes, I wanted to talk about the milestones from the past because it shows you one thing, 2013 until 2023. You see there's constant development and there is a reason why there is constant development. What development are we talking about? We talk about legislation. If you look into the flag as a product that you want to convince the ship owner of, then the tool to develop the product, the product development is legislation. So Portugal passed various laws on those 10 years, mostly, or I think almost exclusively on initiative of Euroma and the ship owners. Those were not political matters in the background, those were usually technical matters, uh, meaning they weren't part of the political debate in the country, but it was understood by all parties involved this brings value to the flag and to the registry and therefore makes it more interesting for ship owners to go under Portuguese flag. There was the ratification of various international conventions, which you need if you want to compete as a flag. There was an armed guards law that allows to hire private armed guards on board. The biggest piece, and here I'd like to raise the question, what other country would do that? You know, Take your ship mortgage in your hands in your legislative branch and make it more bankable so that your ship owners have an easier time when they use your ship mortgage. Katya spoke about it and gave all details. This was a remarkable piece of legislation which shows us one thing. Portugal wants shipping. The legislator wants shipping. The opposition wants shipping. It's a, it's a consensus in the political realm of Portugal. They want more ships under the flag. They want shipping companies to move. They want to develop this industry. And that's why we had a sharp curve, curve upwards in those 10 years where deliberately and clearly and strategically the plan was followed and implemented to make the flag more interesting. Here, you, again, you see what happened in those 10 years. Every year there was a way forward. And if you're a ship owner, you do see value in the fact that you can turn to a government and administration that says, yes, come over, let's sit down, let's talk. I mean, as opposed to some, let's say, offshore jurisdictions, this is a democracy with a strong rule of law, with a division of powers, with a parliament that's being elected, with a political process. So this needs to be considered. But that makes the statement I'm making with this slide only stronger. The fact that Portugal managed in those 10 years to turn legislation almost upside down, or let's say forward in the interest of attractive shipping, is a remarkable fact and should give comfort to everyone who looks into registering under Portuguese flag. So let's take a look into the future, what we believe is ahead. <clears throat> we believe now, and the numbers prove it, because there's no better test for the quality of a flag, but ship owners and ships choosing to sail under Portuguese flag. And I presented the numbers, the numbers are strong. Within very few years, and it's difficult to change flags, so it requires a lot from a ship owner to do, choose a different flag. Within those 10 years, the flag went from almost zero to number 12 in the world, almost number three now in Europe. There's more ahead, so the strong competitiveness will even become stronger. There will be a direct and online-based communication on a common platform with the authorities. There will be a reform of the armed guards law, which is already a good one, we believe, to make the administrative process leaner. There will be an electronic ship mortgage, and talking about it already today, you can record your mortgage on a bank holiday, name me another country that allows that. There's a tonnage tax law in the interest of ship owners to literally relocate to Portugal that will undergo reform. There is uh, ambitious legislation for inland waterways. So vessels sailing on inland waterways, also an interesting market when it comes to the European Union. There is, I saw, uh, uh, I saw in the little chat that we have, there were questions about green shipping. There is a new fee schedule coming up, rewarding those vessels that are in compliance and that aim higher when it comes to the avoidance of CO2 and other emissions. And last but not least, and super important, there is the goal, the political administrative goal, to have maximum use of, of online tools and in the future of artificial intelligence to make the work with the Flex State Administration and its helping hands um, as convenient as possible. So let us really be in the 21st century in a market that sometimes feels like first half of the 20th century when you look into other flag states that use hard copy, semen books, etc. while Portugal with literally all certificates um, is already online. It shows the mentality and we believe, um, you know, we are, we are only the private service providers in between. Um, but we believe this government makes it very attractive for shipping to look into the Portuguese flag and into the Madeira ship registry. We expect a growth in the next few years from now 800 something to 1000 to 1500 even I would say within the next 10 years to 2000 merchant vessels being registered under Portuguese flag and more important 
with happy ship owners owning those ships under Portuguese flag. So I think I kept the required time. And if you could move on now. Um, the vision is, I mentioned, is to be in the top 10 globally, to be number one in Europe, to have a very strong ESG impact. It is already in the tonnage tax law. It will be in the fee schedule of the ship registry. To be fully digital and to make strong and ambitious use of artificial intelligence <clears throat> and to maintain the excellent rating of the flag in the interest of the clients of the flag on all port state control rankings. Please move on. So aside from thank you, I would like to say a ship registry and a flag. Let's look at this into government. A government, when competing for ships, also for ship owners to move there, should always ask itself the same question. What can I do for the ship owners? As a, as a government, as an authority, as a legislative body, as a registry, as a flag. And we can gladly say after 10 years, this is certainly a question that is always in the air with Portuguese authorities. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to our panelists today, Katia, Marina and Ulbrecht, uh, for your fantastic presentations and, of course, to our audience for watching. I will now move on to the Q&A section of the webinar in which I'll be asking the audience's questions to the panelists. Uh, most of these I will just direct to the, panel, the panelists. Uh, generally, there are a couple in here that are directed to an individual panelist, uh, and so, of course, I will I'll signpost that as well. Um, we'll begin with... Uh, the first question, which is, what are the compliance requirements for vessels registered under MAR? Should I go ahead? Yes, please free, feel free, yes, Arthur, please. So, vessel type is no limitation, but there is an age limitation, 15 years. If you are a client of MAR, you can go up to 21 years with tankers and passenger vessels even a little bit higher, but then you need to bring younger tonnage as well. And there's obviously a quality requirement. A flag such as Portugal, a registry like Madeira, wants to see quality, is very gladly on quarter of 21 and wide lists. So preferably not a very low performer in, let's say, Paris MOU on the, on the, on the DOC side, but owners and ship managers who have proven their quality and their sense of compliance. Thank you, Ulbrecht. Uh, and then moving on, we have... Uh, what are the upcoming changes or enhancements that stakeholders should be aware of regarding MAR? I think that was covered in my second to last slide. Yep. Sure, okay. Uh, in, in that case, we'll move on to our third question. In what ways could MAR evolve to better serve the maritime community in the future? I guess that one was covered also. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, one line. I think every institution that competes and that is ambitious should just, you know, never go to sleep without asking itself, what can we do better? And that refers to service, quality, availability, professionalism. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, and then we have uh, a longer question here uh, about a specific scenario, which is, uh, my cargo is being shipped upstream from Mumbai to Antwerp on a ship registered with Madeira International Shipping Register. Suddenly, she comes across a situation like the Evergreen stuck up in the Suez Canal. The cargo is delayed by three weeks. What extra mile would Madeira walk to help me? Uh, and what is the legal remedy for this delay against Madeira? There is no legal remedy because we need to understand the role of a ship registry. The ship registry has zero influence here. You have two options, you know. You can either pray that when you move into the Suez Canal and the Ever Given blocks your way, that the Dutch salvage company does a good job and in, in a few days you can continue sailing, or you turn left on the way to Suez and you go around the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, the ship registry does not have the function to make sure that waterways are free and, and available. The ship registry, I would like to say, has a double function. On the one hand, it monitors compliance because it's a government and you want to make sure law needs to be enforced, uh, that your law doesn't only apply on board of the ship that's registered with Portugal, but it's also, you know, the ship manager acts compliantly. So, and the other thing is, and that's much more important, I think a flag is a service provider. 
a serve an administrative service provider for the ship manager and and for the person who has asked the cargo question he's not even a client of the ship manager he's a client of the operator or even the shipping company that uses the operator i'm awfully sorry we would like to lift the container from the ship stuck in front of the panama or the suez canal and take it straight to Antwerp. not the task of the ship registry thanks very much albrecht uh, and next we have a question specifically for marina uh, which is, what are the aspects you take in your due diligence for registering a vessel? Well, I think this question can be addressed in two ways, because you will have uh, uh, several documents to be assessed. On You have technical documents, as Albert has mentioned. You need to uh, have an initial survey report of the vessel. You will need to look into the age of the vessel. And then you have the legal documents that you need in, in order to register the, the, the vessel. So you will need to have, we will need to have a certificate of good standing of the company, of the owner, uh, in order to see it exists, uh, because it will be the registered owner of the vessel. We need to see the bill of sale if it has a, a change of, of ownership of, of of the vessel so it will depend on the transaction and if there is a financing involved we will also uh, require the corporate doc documents of the the mortgagor and the, the the finance documents so it we need all those documents in order to proceed with the registration so but there are that they can be addressed in, in in more than one way so you have technical aspects you have legal and you have the finance aspects so um, I don't know, Katya, if you want to add something in terms of due diligence, but to the, we need uh, all these uh, documents, technical and legal, in order to proceed with registration. Yes, well, basically this can be seen in the perspective of the, the maritime administration. So what uh, does the maritime administration take into consideration for the purpose of registering the vessel? Um, and of course, there is the due diligence in terms of documentation, but I believe that this is not the point here. In any case, we will be happy, happy to expand on this. I don't know if the, uh, we will be take, happy to take any questions in writing after this, if uh, just to understand a little bit more the context. Uh, fantastic. And, and then moving on, we have uh, a question that's, that's open to, to the panel. Uh, what are the advantages to me as an exporter if I book my consignment in a Madeira registered vessel? My consignment? Well, I don't think that this is uh, really relevant. What are the advantages well, to me when exporter? Sorry. Yes, 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 Alfred. Do you have any well, idea? The only th this, there's there's a big you know there are many elements in the in the chain of events between the exporter and the ship registry, but I believe for an exporter it is of value to be simply compliant. If you look look into modern legislation in the Western world, you have legislation that requires to review the entire supply chain, um, and you have a robust European jurisdiction. You have the vessel that possibly transport your goods uh, is part of a robust European. Um, uh, jurisdiction, which is, if you want to put it this way, an advantage compared to blacklisted jurisdictions like Panama, Bahamas, Marshall Islands. They're all blacklisted juris jurisdictions for money laundering and so on. Not the flags necessarily, but as jurisdictions. So if you are um, a, um, a company a shipper interested in compliance, yes, I believe this is a big value. And you know you have a very reliable flag that services your ship manager. But it's a little bit abstract, I have to concede. I think that meanwhile we have received further questions from the same person. So is it really uh, obligatory to become, to become tax number for the mortgagee? Yes, you, you, you do need to have a, a tax number to become a mortgagee. That is indeed the requirement. How long does it take? I mean, it, it, it can take uh one day from the moment that we are provided with the relevant document because indeed we will need to have uh, a certificate of registration or a certificate of good standing from the mortgagee in order to be able to apply for for this uh, tax number which is which works as a, a company's number a company's registration number is zero more also working 24 7 <laughs> Sometimes yeah. I think we work more, but you can certainly reach us 24-7. And then can we 
engaged seafarers based on MAR having only tax number but sit in another country? Engaged seafarers based on MAR having only tax number but sit in another Yes, I mean, having a tax number, well, probably, it, it, depending on the structure, sometimes you don't need to have a Portuguese tax number. So, also in this question, we would need to understand a little bit more. I mean, listen, it has nothing yes? to do with tax number and uh, who, what CFRs you hire, it's not connected. It's just not connected. And if I may add, because I've had, I've seen, I did observe confusion on bank side when it comes to the Portuguese tax number. You mentioned, yeah. and I'd like to point out how important this is, that the, what they call the tax number has a double function. And the fact that a mortgagee applies for the tax number, from my understanding, has nothing to do with taxation, but it's the other function of the same number to be allowed to act publicly in Portugal. So there should, yes. nobody should be exactly. to, to receive. Portuguese tax number. It has no implications whatsoever in terms of taxation. It's just, you know, you are a very digital online country and you need this number to act online, meaning, or to act publicly, meaning, for instance, to record a mortgage. Yes. It, 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 what you mean, Abus, is that you don't, you, you will not need, or you will not, because you have this number, you are not any kind of tax obligations in Portugal. That is indeed correct. That was my point I was trying to make. It looks like this person has followed up uh, with with a comment saying, "I have, uh, I have to have the tax number since I'm registering two strip two ships already under Mar as owner." First of all, fantastic, whomever it is that you do register two ships um, uh, under Mar, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm I assume that uh, that you know we took care of it, and um, it says, uh, "Can I be heard? The connection's bad." Yes, we yeah, can it's good. Okay, okay, because I, I got a little message that connection was bad. Um, we are usually taking care of this as part of the registration process. So you should have a text number when you have two ships already registered. But again, it's not a text number. It's a number that allows you to act publicly. Okay. Yeah, uh, so well, it needs to be renewed. I don't know the time the time frame between the first registration and the second registration yeah. of the vessels, but this this as it's it's a corporate number you need in order to be registered as an owner of the vessel, and it, it has this deadline on it of six months, and every six months you need to renew it. So probably it's it's not a new tax number. It will always be the same uh, a corporate number that you, will be renewed several times. If it's valid when you register a new vessel, you don't need to apply for a new one. But if it, that first deadline is already allowed, you only need to renew. But you are not provided with a new or different corporate number every time you register a vessel. It's always the same. Fantastic. Well, uh, is there anything else to, to add on that one? Oh, amazing. Well, uh, that, that concludes today's uh, Mondak webinar. Uh, I'd like to, to thank our audience today uh, for, for coming along and watching. If you have any follow-up questions, I, I would encourage you to, to get in touch with our panelists, uh, who, who I'm sure would be, be happy to have a conversation with you. Um, and once again, I'd like to thank our panelists, Katia, Marina and Ulbrecht, um, for, for such a fantastic presentation. And we will hope to see you all very soon. Thank you. I would like to thank you all also for your attention and again for the opportunity. And uh, again, thank you so much, Alpish, for having joined us on this. Well, thanks for having me and thanks for everyone who took the time to listen.